Think that's on? Yeah, it's on. So I can see on my phone that we've gone live now. So again, it's a real privilege to be up here again. I was sitting back there by Heather and I felt calm and relaxed. And then Warwick said, Scotty will be up soon. And then boom, 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 boom. And that's how I still feel. It's just that absolute nerves and energy and, and everything just hits me um, because I know I'm up here. And then I walk up and my son taps me on a shirt, let the Holy Spirit lead you, Dad. And it's just like, yeah, whether, whether he's that wise, I don't know, okay? But I'm going to take it, okay? So, um, and the other worry I've got this morning is that I've, I've just come off a cold, so every now and then I'm going to cough. So I'm going to do my best not to cough into the mic either. <coughs> All righty. Maturing in Christ. So important. Um, and today we've had a lovely lead in through worship. And I'd really love to continue that now as we um, look at 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 9. Okay, so if you can open your Bibles. First Corinthians 3, 1 to 9. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people that live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and God's building. <coughs> All right, and as I prepared this this week, um, I, I really, yeah, it, it really dawned on me the challenge of, of what this means in us. It's easy to look back and look at a church like First Corinthians where Paul was aching for what had gone on with it, what had gone backwards with it. But you know what? It can so easily slip into our church here. It can so easily slip into any church. Um, so my real prayer this morning is, is that we come off looking at last week, Andrew talking about that we've got God's wisdom in us. This chapter is all about actually how well are we using God's wisdom in us? Or are we reverting back to human wisdom and human ideas and actually God's not good enough for us. We need more than God because we need stuff in the flesh to happen for us. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey this morning. Okay, and kids, I'm so sorry that you're in here, and I'm going to try to make it quick because you are, um, but I really pray that you'll get something out of this too. Okay, and it talks a lot about children, actually, this, this passage. <coughs> Salmon. Okay, going to talk about fish first. Don't know anything about fish. Don't really enjoy fishing. I enjoy the company on a boat, but don't enjoy fishing itself. Okay, but when you think about salmon, they have a difficult journey. Okay, they actually have to swim up river. They actually got to leap up waterfalls like you're seeing right now. They have to avoid bears, eagles, and any other predator around. If they're lucky, they make it back to the place where they were born. They go away thousands of kilometers and then come back to that same place. Seems very interesting for me. They turn bright red to show that they're ready to mate. Okay, the female digs the nest and then she lays thousands of eggs and then both those salmon die soon after. Only a few of the eggs will ever hatch. The young salmon leave the nest after a couple of days. They swim down river to the sea. On the way, the bears and the eagles are a threat once more, and many salmon do not even make it to the sea. 
Those that do live in the ocean until they're about four years old. And then they return on that same journey of risk and danger and challenge, just like their parents did. The amazing life cycle continues. <coughs> now you can probably guess where I'm going with this, but to be quite honest, we're a bit like the salmon really, we are going against the flow. Okay, Christians in this world are going against everything else. Okay, it's like the world's going this way and we're trying to go this way. Okay, you're going against the grain of the world. You're trying to breathe different air than exists in your atmosphere and that isn't easy. You're finding yourself like a spiritual salmon. While everyone else is floating downstream, you're fighting the current. You keep slamming against the wall of worldliness trying to break through. You aren't swimming the way the rest of the fish are swimming. You're going against the current and it isn't easy. The world is geared to go in a certain direction, but you go the opposite way and that makes it hard. And that's the external pressure of living the Christian life. And I keep looking at that picture there and I just go, so when do you get to a point where you just wanna swim with the river? And that's the same as us. When do we get to a point where we just go, it's too hard, I just want to go with the world, I want to go with it. And that's what's happening to the Corinthian church. So secondly, you've got the world on one side, but then there's also this internal problem, right? You're going against the grain of what your flesh wants you to do, your own humanness. Paul put it this way in Romans 7, I love to do God's will so far as my new self is concerned, but there is something deep within my flesh that is at war with my mind, and it wins the fight, making me a slave to the sin that is still in me. That's the internal battle that we have as well. We're swimming against the current, we're swimming against our own humanness as well, what our body and our mind and our heart and our soul, where they want to take us. That's, that's the joy of being a Christian. And I think sometimes as Christians, we think we've found salvation, that great blessing, that great miracle of salvation, and then it gets easy. Okay, then it's just cruise control. My last analogy is I love, um, uh, as a teacher at Matarau School, every year we do cross-country training. Hey, Isaac. <coughs> and we run up a road called Tudor Hope Road. And I love it when the new kids come to the school and they run up Tudor Hope Road for the first time. Because Tudor Hope Road starts with a run like this, you know, and you run up there and you think, cool, I'm gonna get to the top and it'll be easier once I've got to the top. And then what Tudor Hope Road does is it goes like this, it goes down and then it goes up. So you get to the top and then instead of victory, you go, oh my goodness, is that what I've still got to run? And again, that's what it can be like in our Christian lives. We run and we get to a point and then we want to cruise. We want it to be easy. We want it to just seem simple. It's like me doing sermons. I keep, keep asking, when does it get to the point when I come up here and I find it easy? Okay, and it's, I don't think it's ever going to. I think that's, 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 when I lose that sensation, I think I'll know that I'll be trusting in me rather than in the Lord. Um, so anyway, I haven't even got to the passage yet, okay. Today I want to talk about the heart behind the problem, okay. Actually, God's taken me on this road rather than, yeah, but this is where I want to really, to focus on actually the, the, the Church of Corinth had all these problems, but behind every person, you have to make a decision about where you sit, um, and these categories, I don't know if you like them or not, but they work for this. So there is the natural man who I don't really want to talk about today. That is the person without Christ. They don't know him. They've got no idea. They live in darkness. Okay. Then we have what's called spiritual people in this verse, and that's just us. It's Christians. Okay. And then for the sake of a definition, I'm going to use a, a word carnal. Carnal means of the flesh means to be driven by the sensations of the flesh. Okay, and beside that, a worldly Christian. 
It's like you've got your foot in salvation, but the rest of you wants to be in the world. You are a Christian, but just, it's the best way to describe it. Um, and we know that, that Paul, when he talks to the church of Corinth, he's actually saying you are Christians because you've done some other stuff that I know that you're Christians, but just, okay? So that's the group we're going to be talking to. So every second slide, I'm going to have that up with a couple of learnings on it. Um, and this is really my application today will be what's on the blue slides that you see. All righty. Let's get to this. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Now, to be quite honest, I think the whole letter of 1 Corinthians, if you were a member of that church, you would have been sitting back thinking, we're actually quite spiritual. We're doing okay. We're, we've actually passed the level of where we were expected, and now we're doing other things like elevating our teachers and deciding which camp we sit into for the wisdom of all of that. But actually, they're so not. Okay? You don't act like Christ followers, but a church full of the unsaved. That's how bad it is. And again, if you think about what he just talked about in 1 Corinthians 2, okay, that um, they had taught God's wisdom among the mature, apparently referring to those who come to God by faith in Christ, and are ready for the deeper truths of God, Corinth fails so sadly, so badly. He also describes spiritual people as, um, as Christians who understand and believe the spiritual things with the help of God's Holy Spirit. But he can't call them spiritual people here. And the problem is, again, as I've already said, is it's not that they're not Christians. It's the way they've chosen to live their lives. It's, and you get to that last little bit there. You are mere infants in Christ. Now, that's not a good thing. Okay? It's not a good thing at all. Now, the Church of Corinth would have all come out of Jews and those that had come to the Lord from the Gentiles. So it would have been a very new church, okay, without a lot of understanding and knowledge. Paul taught there for 18 months. It's been like several years since he's gone, and yet they're still infants. He calls them infants. And I actually think it's a slur that he's calling them an infant. You're an infant. Do you understand what an infant is? It can't do anything. It needs to be spoon-fed. It's completely vulnerable. It's, it's immature in a sense of what it is for its stage of life. Okay, you are like that. You're infants. And again, it's quite challenging to just to think about the stages of development we have. Okay, and a new believer comes to Christ. And I don't even think a new believer on their first day of becoming a Christian is an infant. Because if that believer wants to learn and mature, they've already gone past the infant stage. So for the Corinth church, Paul's really desperate to make the point, you are so far behind where you should be. They are still newborn, weak, undeveloped Christians. They continue to live in the flesh, meaning that they're living for self and that their bodily appetites, instead of living in the power of God that he's given to them in the Holy Spirit. Great picture. Nothing wrong with being an infant if you are an infant. But if you should be more mature, yeah. Imagine if we had grey-haired infants in the church today. Okay, like, yeah. Anyway, moving on. So the points I want to make here is that if you are a Christ-loving believer, you have to be maturing. Okay, and we're going to hear more about milk and solid food, right? You've got to be moving through that. You have to have a desire. Okay, unfortunately, if you're carnal, you stay at that same place. You grab that joy of salvation and then say, I want to cruise. I want to stay in this sweet, easy place. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes to from here. Verse two, I gave you milk, not solid food. If you were not ready for it, indeed, you're still not ready. 
So again, if I think about the Apostle Paul, he came to Corinth, he spent 18 months there. He has moved on. It's probably three or four years later by this stage. Okay, Apollos has been there. There would have been other people there that would have been helping with the teaching. Okay, and yet what he's still saying is that when he came, he knew that they were so young in their faith that they needed milk, basic concepts to grasp in the faith. Okay, to get them started. They weren't ready for the solid food. Okay, because, and the, the slur of this passage is that he says, indeed, you're still not ready. Okay, now, I had a wonderful time at my connect group um, earlier this week, and I thrashed out this passage with them. Okay, and um, some of the ways I communicate this today are because of how we discuss this. And you can't equate, and this is one of the big teachings they gave me, and it, it's pretty obvious, so you can't equate your age to a spiritual age. Okay, because you're, well, I'm always turning 50, that doesn't mean anything spiritually because I'm turning that age. Okay, you can't be 85 and say that my spiritual age is over 85. Because I know people that are half my age with an intense sense of who they are in Christ. And you just look at them and you think, whoa, you are so mature in Christ. And I look at people my age as well and you think, actually, you're not that mature in Christ yet. So we can't do that, right? We're all at different ages and stages. Okay, all of us. But if we're growing, if we're maturing, if we're moving from milk to the solid stuff, that's where we need to be. Okay. Hebrews 5.12 says that, in fact, this is another example, in fact, through this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainting with teaching about righteousness, the higher concepts. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good and evil. And guess what happened in the Corinth church? They couldn't distinguish good and evil. They couldn't distinguish what is right and wrong in the Lord. And again, it's a great prayer for us as well, isn't it? Do we distinguish those things? The Bible is simple enough for a child to wade in. This is a quote I found. <coughs> I don't really know if that helps with the hand thing, but hey, we'll find out later. The Bible is simple enough for a child to wade in, yet deep enough for an elephant to drown. Unfortunately, too often, many people think it's virtuous to keep the intellectual content of their faith at a child's level. But God expects us to grow in knowledge over the course of our Christian lives. Okay, pray that you would value and come to maturity. Again, I don't want to use any earthly terms. You can't have a growth curve, okay, because actually in Christ, when do you stop learning about God? When do you actually say, okay, I've got the Bible sorted now, I understand it fully, okay? Never, right? And we won't understand it fully until we get to heaven and actually have a really good debrief session. Okay? Seriously, we've all got so much to learn. There's no one on this earth that can actually say, I've, I'm there. I'm there, actually. Like, we have lots of people that have given their lives to the word um, who still see so much more to learn. And, and that's the great thing about the Bible. The deeper you go, the more there is to take. Okay? So much more. So my second point on this blue screen is yet that to know the heart of a, a spiritual person, a Christian, are you ready to grow in Christ? Does the Bible excite you? Okay, does being here on a Sunday excite you? Does your devotional time excite you? Okay. Can you feed yourselves? Um, again, COVID was interesting with lockdown, you know, because it was like, okay, there's no church. We're, we're going to have to do things differently. So all you got at the very start was this quick little video thing from us on a Sunday morning. 
we needed so much more, don't you? And again, on the, the carnal side, you get distracted. Okay, you're not letting yourself grow. Okay, you're immature. You're okay with not understanding and not worrying about um, moving on in your Christian life. There's too much other stuff you'd like to do. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Oh, again, these poor guys at Corinth. This is just like a big plank of wood just being slammed across them just to tell them where they're at at the moment. Okay, so because their hearts are in the wrong place, this is the outworking of what's going on in their hearts. All the stuff comes to the surface. And if you're like me sometimes, these things creep into my heart and it's like I fight hard for them never to surface out and fight hard to, um, you know, again, with the Holy Spirit to actually suppress and work through them and let them go. But for the Corinth church, these things came to the surface and then erupted. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which is on immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, um, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. And unfortunately, each Sunday, I think we're going to hear more and more of these things being unpacked. But what I love about Paul is there's always an answer to each of these issues that they've got. He said that they were controlled by your sinful nature. The way, the way he poses that question means that Paul understood that they were going to have to say, yeah, unfortunately, that's us. Yeah, we, we can't deny this. This is actually what's happening with us. Okay, the Corinthians, if they were honest, had to admit they were living selfish lives, not godly lives. They had been believers long enough that they knew better, but they were not living better. All right, and again, if you think about those things, and again, the answer to those is in Christ. It's in growing. It's in maturity. Okay, it's in prayer. It's in the way we see ourselves in front of a brother and or sister in Christ. It's in the way we see ourselves in front of, is this something that I can help with, or do I want to stand back and judge? Which is another thing I tend to do a bit and very analytic. I call it analytical, but analytical actually means I'm judging people. Okay, and that's something that I, I feel in my, yeah, the Holy Spirit nudges me about all the time. Can't help it. Comes from sport. So again, if you look at this, my implications are here too, is, is does your life show the fruits of the Spirit? Is there a desire to be excited by the fruits of the Spirit in your life? All these things behind us, love, joy, peace, patience, <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do they work out on your everyday actions? Are we, and I think I've got this the right way, in the world, but we're not of the world as Christians? We know that we're on a mission, we're in the world, but we don't get contaminated by the world. It's what we're always trying to do. We're going to take hits every now and then, but our core focus has to be that we're on mission. And are we Christ-focused? Yeah, the more we stay Christ-focused, the more we don't get distracted by everything else that you could think of. On the carnal side, those things all come to the top. And again, what your heart becomes full of, okay, you can't contain after a while. And you'll all know what it's like if you're sitting here right today and you think, there's someone in this church I don't like. Okay, and it's like you're battling to be polite you're battling to do the right thing. You're battling to never show it. You might think, man, this guy up the front, he is useless. I really don't like him as a teacher. But you're being polite. But actually God asks us to do more with that, to work it through to a point where actually there is that respect and that understanding of well, what's that person's heart about? Why am I actually judging this person? Is it their fault or is it my fault? Do I need to deal with that? Okay, and this person is of the world. They might turn up to church once every two or three Sundays or, you know, whatever. But they're sitting there, but actually their mind is probably in other places. And the sermon is the time where they want to switch off and get back to thinking about last night's football or whatever. 
you know, so there are lots of things that happen in our minds. You know, my connect group also said I shouldn't give too many examples of what I think it is because there are lots of good reasons why we might not be here on a Sunday, okay, or why something else might be happening in your life. But only you can understand the motive behind the why you're not doing something or the why something else is more important at the moment. Okay? I've just done a production at Matarau this week and it was all consuming for me. Okay? But then at the end of the week, it was like switch it off and now get back into, okay, focusing on what's more important. It needed my attention for that time. It's the things that carry on and it's like, actually, I'm more interested by this than actually by church or thinking about other stuff. Anyway, you probably think I'm rambling a bit. Verse four, for when one says I follow Paul and another says I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What after all is Apollos and what is Paul? They're only servants. Now I put up this map. <coughs> Um, because I want you to understand and see that the, um, the actual pressure, the influence that was on the people in the Corinth church. You know, so around them in this city, there are temples everywhere. There are different religions everywhere. There's just stuff going on. There is the Greek, there is the Roman, there is everything. Okay, you name it. If it's popular, it's happening and it's big. So this is the influence they get when they're not at church, okay? When they're doing their everyday lives. So this church decided that they needed to not just focus on Christ because they had that sorted out and they're already way past that for their spirituality, but actually let's bring in some Greek wisdom, which is to um, exalt our teachers so they would put themselves into camp saying that we are of the camp that follows Paul because Paul is by far the better teacher and he is by far the wiser and that makes us wiser by connotation. We want to follow Apollos because we think his style is way better than even the Paul's. So they're creating this crazy sort of division going on. They took a side. Now, this is not new to people, right? And I've got a whole list of things I'm going to run through here. We love to take a side, whether it's tribalism, whether it's just judgmentalism, whether it's just our personal preference, we want to take a side. All right, let's, let's start with the deep stuff. Ford versus Holden. New South Wales versus Queensland. Queensland all the way there. Pizza Hut versus Domino's. Now, I have made a commitment that I will never eat Domino's. So when we have a night here where there is Domino's, I will not partake of the Domino's. That's how ridiculously strong I've made that decision. Okay? It's food, right? It's a piece of pizza. But pizza do it way better. And please don't let this be the one takeaway from today like the fish and chips was last time either. TV1, TV3 news. Okay, your gaming choice. Isaac over there, he loves his gaming. And then we get to some of the more interesting ones, the harder ones. Where did you sit in COVID? Okay, what's your position on the end times? In America, Republican or Democrat? Okay, what is your favorite preacher? You know, a MacArthur, a Piper, you know, which camp do you put yourself into? What's the book or what's the program that you think is the ultimate for churches rather than the Bible? What denomination is better? Okay, and why is that denomination worse than our denomination? Global warming. Oh. KJV, NIV. NLT, CEV, the message. And some of you will not be happy with some of those. You'll be like, message, mm -mm. But for a lot of Christians, that is what they're ready to feed on. So again, and this is what this church did. And unfortunately, we have the tendency to do it as well. But in all those options I just gave you, I want to come back to something that again was spoken about a couple of weeks ago. I think it was Andrew. Where is Christ in your position? 
Is he above your position or is he lost in your position? All right, another personal anecdote here. Right, Warwick and Andrew. When I was a very new preachery type person, okay, I used to look at them and I used to be like, I, I want to be like them. I want to be like Warwick. I want to be energetic and exciting and I want to move away from the pulpit and dance on the stage and be excited. And I want to be like Andrew, where I can let words flow off my tongue that are really complex and hard and make it all look so easy. And then I realized I was failing miserably to the point where it was like, I want to give up on this whole teaching thing because I can't do what they do. Terrible attitude, eh? But actually what God taught me out of that is look at the heart of them. Look at the heart of Warwick, his passionate desire to know scripture. Okay, look at Andrew, his humbleness and actually approaching the way he teaches. You'll never see him up here like sort of, you know, it's all about me. And there are others I could talk about, Terry, you know, Murray, you know, your heart's for the words, your actual real life experience in it. And that's when, of course, it dawned on me is you're going to be the preacher that you're going to be. Okay, unfortunately, every time I try to leave the pulpit, it's like magnetism and it draws me back. Okay, I just have to hold something. I'll never be like that. And I've talked to both these two about it. And to be quite honest, it, it's now I've got to that point where it's like, you're going to get what you're going to get out of me. Okay, which is someone who sincerely wants to teach the word, who's, who may not know all that other stuff, but who wants to teach the word sincerely. Don't compare ourselves to others and try to be others because God's made us to be a certain way. And this church missed that point of actually going. It's not about the person at the front of the church. In the old days, in Terry, like Terry's old days, okay, we used to have David Cantwell, Mr. Crosby, and when I was a very, you know, very new here, Ian, you know, he was a teacher here too, and I used to look at them and you know, with Mr. Crosby and Mr. Cantwell, I used to turn off a bit and think, oh my goodness, this is so boring. Why can't they be more like Terry? And then I realized what a terrible attitude I was bringing because I was actually judging the messenger, not hearing the message. So then I started taking notes, which then kept my head down so much, I wasn't even focused on what the messenger was doing. Okay, that actually when I took notes, I realized there's an amazing message of hope here that they're sharing with me. And I went and apologized to both of them too for the attitude I had on them. Yeah, we've, we've got to get away from that, eh? There should be no favorite teacher here. Andrew might do a lot of the teaching, but we shouldn't be judging our teachers. Judge the word we share. At the end of this verse is the key thing. So what was Apollos and what is Paul? They're nothing but mere men. They are messengers. They're instruments of God. Okay? Only servants. They made themselves available. That's the best thing I ever did in my life. I make myself available to be used by God. doesn't matter if you're good or bad. You make yourself available and you do the little stuff, and then all of a sudden, God will be chucking you some big stuff. Okay, we just have to be faithful. Servants. They knew their role. They went there for a purpose. And by the way, this passage, Paul and Apollos, I love the way Paul writes about himself, okay, but Paul and Apollos, they were on the same page. They knew their role. They were there to help that church find Christ, to grow in Christ, to understand what an amazing God he was. Oh, I didn't do that. So remember too, my takeaways from this for us, and you might be adding more on your own and why, to be servant-hearted, to be followers of Christ, to live for God, Okay, to know that God is equipping you, that God has given you gifts that he expects you to be using as well. 
Okay, whereas for a carnal, worldly Christian, it's like, well, I accepted Christ at salvation, but actually I'm more interested in looking at the church of how we can improve it. And, you know, that could be the building. Well, let's improve the building. That'll make it more exciting. Let's, let's get a bigger band and, and make that more amped up. Let's amp it up, you know. But actually, it's not about any of those things. Okay, it's actually about the simple focus of we're here to worship God. From the person who does communion, to the person who cleans the floors in here, to our teams that are out at Papadua Bay and out at Marston Bay, they're servants of God wanting to go and serve him. We need to be praying for those guys this week too, eh? Okay. Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord is assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Isn't that amazing? You know, I'm one of these people that, you know, I'm walking along and then I look at, at, at a weedy flower or something that's popped out of Joe's garden and it's just like, that's a weed, but its flower is magnificent. You know, and it's just little things like that. And when you think about how things grow, it's actually quite an amazing process. It's like that God factor, right? And you actually watch things develop. Paul planted, evangelized, um, Apollos watered, taught and discipled. And those guys knew who they were before the Lord. I love the line that the Lord assigned to each his task. Okay, and how does that apply even to here? Do you know what your task is at Clark Road Chapel in the body of Christ? They both fully understood that if they made themselves available, used the giftings they had from the Lord and stayed focused on the task, that God would do the rest. To the point of they knew if they watered and if they planted, actually God's got this under control. They didn't worry about the next stage. They didn't try to force the next stage. None of them thought to themselves, I'm going to make Christians here today. I'm going to preach so eloquently that someone comes to Christ in my own power. Can't do that. It's God that gives the increase. It's if anything happens and if anything does work, it's God that did it. You look at our own lives. No man could change your heart. And as, as eloquent as anyone is, no one can have an eternal impact on your life. They can have an impact for a time. It's like trying to do those fitness workouts or stuff like that. You think, oh, I've got a good teacher. But after a while, it's like I, I'm giving away now. But God has the impact on our lives. And then it comes to this reward part, okay, that there is a reward. And what I love about this is that each one will receive his own reward. All work together, but each is rewarded individually. Reward is not given according to gifts or talents or even success, but actually for their labor. Now, this is not about getting to heaven by our labor, but this is actually saying it doesn't matter if you don't, you know, by being available, by actually getting out and doing the mahi, these guys doing camps this week will be rewarded in heaven for that. There was a special reward coming for them. They knew their role. So it doesn't matter if you're sitting there thinking, I can't do this or I can't do that. God can use you somewhere to increase his kingdom and to give him glory. It was a missionary... Um, a missionary in India for 35 years saw one convert that God will pay him for his labor in eternity, not for his success. And there are people that have all kinds of things happening. Maybe they don't labor like the man. So he says, don't think we're fighting, we're one. This is Paul and Apollos. And the Lord's going to take care of rewarding. You don't need to pass on the laurels. God will do it. Okay, we just have to be available. God's going to do the miracle working, but he does need us to be present in this mission. That's why we're here. 
to be part of that mission. The list is getting longer now. So again, as a Christian, we need to understand what our gifting is in Christ. We need to be available. We need to understand who gets the real credit in our lives. Who gets the credit for the ministry that we're doing? Who gets the credit for the success we had? Who gets the credit for the frustration we had of just serving but thinking, oh, nothing's happening? About, I don't know, a long time ago, when Glenn McIntosh and I were doing camps out at Marston Bay, I used to run the programs because I was afraid of actually teaching at that stage. I was too young as a Christian, I think. That was my excuse anyway. But Glenn McIntosh did the teaching. Bob, you'd remember these camps. <coughs> so Glenn would get up there every camp and, and he would teach and preach to the best of his ability and he'd give it to God. Okay, camp after camp for about two years. And after every camp, he'd just come to me and say, I'm not doing well enough. Like no one is, is coming forward. No one's becoming a Christian. No one is acknowledging Christ. No one's, and, and he did this in a way that wasn't about him, but just frustration of we should get someone else to do the teaching and the preaching because obviously I'm not good enough. Okay. And then we got Lou Meyer to come in for a camp, and most of you will know Lou. And anyway, he preached at this camp. He did a great job. He taught the kids. Again, he covered a lot of the same stuff that Glenn did. And at the end of the camp, we had like over 25 kids come to Christ. And I remember Lou saying, um, I, I didn't do this. You know, again, Glenn, you planted the seed in these kids' hearts. Okay, I just came along and I, and I got the harvest at the right time. But again, we didn't do this in isolation. We did this together in Christ's power. It was his timing for these kids to come to God. It was a great lesson for me. It just, it just reminded me about my timing for when God should be working and actually God's timing for when things happen. So again, for a carnal Christian, not mature enough to see their gifting, and again, they give the credit and status to the wrong place. They want to uplift their teachers. Oh, you know, look at that. Didn't, didn't Paul do an amazing job of preaching today? And look how many people came to Christ through Paul's, Paul's great teaching and eloquence. They miss the point of who gives the miracle working and who gives the actual working. Almost finished. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarding according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, and God's building makes the things grow. Paul understood his place and role in the kingdom. He was like a shovel or a plow to the farmer. He was like the farmer who takes the seed and plants the seed and waters the seed. He can do all that, but... It's only God that gives the growth. The new life comes from God. A spiritually mature believer is not focused on themselves, but on the work. A spiritually mature believer is not seeking acknowledgement or accolades here, but knows that they're coming in heaven. A spiritually mature believer understands their place in God's plan. We aren't those who do the work. A spiritually mature believer understands that their lives are a field for God to plant, mature, and cultivate. A spiritually mature believer understands that their lives are like a building that God is making. It's his choice of materials, his choice of design, his choice in when and where the building is built. And I know that as elders, I think, and especially when you come up here to preach, okay, um, Galatians 1.10, am I trying to win the approval of you as, as people, okay, or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. God is the one I need to please. God is the one I try to you know, make sure that he is the one that is front and center in whatever I teach. It's God that will actually reward me or have a serious chat to me about where my heart was when I tried to teach you about something else.
We have one purpose, to glorify God, to live for God, to be his tools, to be his shovels and plows and rakes and whatever it is. We need to grow in our godly character, okay, so that that character then develops action. We don't just sit and watch and be a spectator. And we also need to be effective co-workers together. Actually, that's something I probably should have spoken more on. Okay, the beauty of the church is that we're here together to walk on this path of actually knowing what our one purpose is. I think the camp teams are that perfect idea now of that there are co-workers out there laying the ground ready for God to do the miracle working. And that's us as well. Again, on the carnal side, okay, confused priorities. Hear a bit of church, come here on a Sunday and think, okay, that's, that's good. But actually through the week, something else is driving their importance, whether it's money or status or jobs or whatever, okay? An interest that's gone out of control, whatever. They're still infants mimicking others. They might be able to say the right thing sometimes, but does their maturity go into action is, is a really good bit of evidence. And they're also not understanding the fact that they're missing opportunities to be blessed by God because their heart is still in the world. So as I finish off today, that's that list. That's my application right there. And now I come back to us as a church, you know, and where we are before God. You know, you could be sitting in that pew and you're still very much a carnal, worldly Christian. You look good on the outside, and I could never pick it, but God does. As a church body, you know, are we applying those things that it is that God wants us to be doing? Are we real in our relationships? Are we real in the outside world? Are we salt and light? Or are we mute and distracted and worrying about the things? I think in our group, someone said, I think it was Grant that said, as humans, we want to find the stuff that's easy and pleasing. Christ doesn't ask us to look in the world for the stuff that's easy and pleasing. He looks for the stuff that's hard, that needs to be watered, that needs seeds to be sown into, your neighbour, your workmates, whatever it is. You've heard it a thousand times from the front here. This is me as well. I, I'm pretty broken hearing about the stuff. I look down that list and I think, oh man, I fall back into that carnal side at times. And I've got to, you know, the Holy Spirit nudges and prompts me. And then I've got to get back to actually where my priorities are real and true. Anyway, we're going to go into communion. Okay. And I'm actually going to pray now um, and lead us into communion from this. <coughs> Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, um, again, Lord, I, I really pray, Lord, that uh, as I've spoken this morning, that my heart, my actions and my words have come together, Lord, to again bring praise and honour to you, Lord. Um, Lord, again, we know that we have your word. We have a step up on the Corinth Church because we have your Bible that guides us, that keeps us close to you, Lord. But Lord, as we approach this communion table now, Lord, um, again, may we look introspectively at ourselves, Lord. May we um, understand where we're at at the moment. What are the things that excite us for you, Lord? Um, how big is, is you, are you as a part of our life each week, Lord? How real are you in our day-to-day -day walk, Lord? So, Lord, again, as we break... Um, you know, break the bread this morning, Lord. Again, I, I really pray, Lord, that again we understand what your son, Jesus Christ, did for us on the cross. He came as a servant-hearted. He was He's the king of kings, but yet he came as a servant. He came as an infant. He came as a, a tiny little baby. And yet his heart was for you. He knew his mission. He knew his purpose. So, Lord, again, Lord, please allow us to not stray from you, Lord, to really understand the heart that you have for us, to understand also, Lord, that we just need to be available for you, Lord.
You do the real working in our lives. Lord, let us please remember that. For it is your name we pray. Amen.